Hi, I'm Phil Stepanian. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oklahoma in the Advanced Radar Research Center. My name is Philip Jilson. I'm a professor in the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. I'm Jeff Kelly. I'm a professor at the University of Oklahoma and the director of the Oklahoma Biological Survey. And we've recently published a paper in Methods in Ecology and Evolution entitled An Introduction to Radar Image Processing in Ecology. Ever since the discovery that airborne organisms were capable of being detected by radar, ecologists have leveraged this technology to study birds, bats, and insects. The level of complexity has been increasing over the years since 1945 when this um, finding was first reported in the open literature until now in 2014. That's been like almost 70 years, so there's been a lot of advancements in how radar has been used for the studies of the movements of animals. And radar is an important tool for helping us do that because it allows us to see in places where uh, other observation systems don't work. Well, I think the strengths of radar are really quite apparent when you look at nocturnal movements of animals. In the past, you know, people used to have to do um, moon watchings or tagging the animals and monitoring their movements using um, radio telemetry or thermal imaging. But radar provides surveillance across a wide range of spatial scales from the local foraging movements of single animals all the way up to continental scale migration. And also typically at high temporal resolution, sometimes on the order of minutes. And especially at um, some of the larger fixed radar sites, these data will be often archived to form long-running data sets. And so those are some of the advantages that let us ask questions about uh, diversity of migrants, distribution of migrants, uh, uh, changes in timing or phenology of, of seasonal movements for individual organisms that, that form big roosts, such as free-tailed bats or purple martens, as well as uh, more diverse migration movements of, of nocturnal songbirds. Well, with any technology, <coughs> there's, a, there's a, a, a large learning curve, and this would be true for you know, the, the radar engineer or the radar physicist. When they start into this field, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty daunting. So one of the biggest challenges for using radar data for biologists is that it just uh, comes in, in formats and, and relies on concepts and theories that we're not taught in our biological training. And so it takes a lot of effort and energy to both understand the radar data and the way it's collected, but also technical ability to uh, access the radar data and, and turn it into something that makes sense to a biologist. There are biologists who have dedicated a sizable portion of their career to learning about how radars operate and how radio waves interact with them. For these individuals, some of the methods that are described in this paper might be obvious, but I would say that for the bulk of the, the biologists, this will be a nice way to jump into the field and, and start getting their, their fingers dirty, as it were. Our hope is with this paper that we'd be able to provide sort of a, a broad overview and first steps for biologists and the way to think about how to process radar data and what the, uh, the basic type of workflow or data processing would look like to move from raw radar data to some biologically interpretable product. The methods that we focus on are a fairly common starting point in a lot of radar processing algorithms already in the literature. But with the different bodies of literature out there um, and the different languages among them, uh, it can be difficult to make the connections. So our hope is to consolidate or unify a lot of these topics and present them in the most straightforward way that we can. What the paper describes is not um, a software package or an automated process. It's more of a conceptual workflow for what sorts of things create problems with radar data and what sorts of steps uh, need to be involved in a workflow the person doing the analysis still needs to know enough about the radar data and about the organisms that are likely to appear in the radar data that they can create a sensible filter that removes things that they're not interested in and keeps things that they are interested in. There is no perfect method. It's a framework. It's a, it's a road map. So before you can take off to some destination unknown, you have to at least have an idea of what kind of landscape you're going to have to navigate. And so this is, is kind of a 
topographical map of what one might expect, but you know, of course, if you want to look into the specific questions, then you have to adapt the method to address your specific questions. So as a very brief demonstration of how one might adapt or apply this algorithm to solve an ecological question, um, we'll do a, a very brief example of isolating signatures from scanning weather radars. KDFX is one part of the United States network of weather radars located in the state of Texas around 50 kilometers from the border with Mexico. This region of North America is home to many large colonies of bats that form large aggregations in caves, under bridges, and within other man-made structures. From early spring through late fall, these bats take part in a nightly exodus as they part depart from their roosts to forage. These large-scale dispersions are commonly observed by radars in the region. A number of questions can be addressed using radar, including the size of these populations, or their distributions, or changes in some metric from night to night, or year to year, or from one roost to another. But the first step in addressing many of these topics would require isolating the bat signatures in the radar data. So here's a radar image from April 1st, 2013, uh, around 0 UTC, which is around 7 p.m. local time so just before sunset. Just to get ourselves oriented, this is a view from above. So we're looking down on the radar. The radar is located at the center of the image with the top of the image being north, the left-hand side being west, the right-hand side being east, and the bottom of the image being south. The image on the left is radar reflectivity factor, or a measure of the strength of the backscattered signal. And the image on the right is the polarimetric product correlation coefficient which is useful just for discriminating between biological signals and weather. In this case, we have quite a lot going on in this image. First, we have a number of storms within the area, which are characterized by high reflectivity factor and correlation coefficients that are close to one. Next, we have this region of insects around the radar, characterized by low reflectivity and more variable correlation coefficient, and their close proximity to the radar. Finally, we have this linear feature, which is a gust front produced by the wind that's rushing out of the storms and lofting insects into the air, forming this well-defined aggregation of insects. As we animate the images, we can see the storms are rolling across the region, and at 7.52 local time, this signature appears. This is called a sunspur and is an artifact caused when the radar measures radiation that is being emitted by the sun when it's near the horizon. So in this case, the sun is setting to the west, so we see this spike emanating westward from the radar. Following sunset, we almost immediately see the bats entering the airspace and forming these round divergent signatures, characterized by lower values of correlation coefficient. And continuing through, the bats continue to fill the airspace with neighboring populations intermix intermixing and eventually filling the radar domain. So let's loop through the process from the beginning one more time. The storms roll across the region, the sun sets, and the bats emerge and begin foraging and filling the airspace. Now let's grab an image to build our image processing algorithm. Here's the image from 102 UTC, so shortly following sunset. While this image is the easiest to interpret visually, this isn't necessarily the most useful for processing. For that, we'll take a look at the corresponding data raster image. So this is the same information but rather than being depicted in physical coordinates, this is the, the raster, the way the data are stored in the computer. From our observations of these images, we've noticed that the bat signals are consistently above 10 dBZ in reflectivity. So that would make a pretty good threshold for making our binary image. So after applying this threshold, we have the signals that are above the level in black and the noise, or what's below this, this threshold in white. Now we need to apply blob coloring, or com connected component labeling, to define contiguous objects. The result of this algorithm is this image, in which each blob has a unique identifying number, and thus is plotted in a unique color. We can now use this raster to index the corresponding rasters of reflectivity and correlation coefficient. For example, we can find the average correlation coefficient in blob number 10, by looking for the pixels with a value of 10 and averaging those pixel indices in the correlation coefficient raster. In this case, we'll look at three quantities for each blob, the number of pixels comprising each blob, 
the mean correlation coefficient, and the maximum reflectivity within the blob. Once we have these quantities, we can set criteria that will reject blobs with certain quantities. For this case, we only retain blobs made up of more than 10 pixels, so this will get rid of speckle and small clutter sources. We'll reject any blobs with a maximum reflectivity over 40 dBz. This will remove strong clutter and storms, and we'll only keep blobs with an average correlation coefficient of less than 0.85, so this should remove other weather signals. And what we should be left with after these, this filtering are strong coherent biological signals that cover a large spatial extent. Now we can apply this process to the other images and see how the results look. Comparing the original images on the left with the processed images on the right, we can see that we've removed the storms, most of the insect signals, and the sun spur. The results get a little bit messy once the bats begin to fill the airspace, and this may or may not be a problem depending on what time period you're interested in and what question you're trying to answer. If you see that these results aren't acceptable, you can go back and adjust the thresholds of the filters until you get a suitable result. And in this case, because we developed the algorithm on an especially difficult case, with weather and insects and the sun spur, there's a pretty good chance that it will work for additional cases on other nights or other years. So this is just one example of how we hope this method can help bring accessibility to radar techniques in ecology.